And now I'm talking to David Donoghue from the United Nations. David, are you still with the United Nations? Uh, I'm not, Darren. I retired from uh, my post as ambassador to the United Nations about a year ago, so I'm living back in Ireland now, but I'm not attached any longer to the UN. And um, were you working for, in the UN for long? I was, uh, I was the Irish ambassador to the UN for four years from uh, 2013 to 17, and during which time I co-chaired the negotiations which led to the Sustainable Development Goals. A huge work went into that. Uh, like, can you give us an indication of how busy you were for those few years doing that? Well, it was it was massive, Darren. In fact, it was probably the biggest and the most complex uh, negotiation that had ever happened at the UN because this was the first time that global goals were actually being negotiated and agreed by all the countries of the world. The, the last set of goals, the Millennium Development Goals, had simply been uh, created by a couple of officials, but they were never actually agreed by all the countries. This time round, uh, 193 UN members had to agree to every word of the of the goals and of the 2030 agenda, as it's called. So th- my job was to try to get that over the line, along with the ambassador of Kenya. And how is it that yourself and the uh, ambassador of Kenya were picked to kind of coordinate it? Well, they, uh, they they normally pick somebody from what's called the global north and somebody from the global south to uh, uh, to coordinate or to lead the negotiations. The theory is that the ambassador from the north will have some idea of the concerns of developed countries, and the one from the south will understand the concerns of the developing countries. Ireland has a good reputation in relation to uh, global development generally. We have a very good uh, aid program, and uh, I suppose we are seen as an honest broker at the UN. We don't come with any particular baggage and we are well regarded by developing countries. All of that would have helped, I think. The ambassador of Kenya had himself been involved in an earlier, smaller version of the negotiations and he was very experienced. So we, we worked well together as a team. And are you happy the goals were launched? I think, it's, I think it's three years ago. Are you happy with how they've progressed since then? Well, it's very hard, Darren, to get an overall sense of how well we're doing. I mean, I think the important thing is that they are still uh, being treated with great enthusiasm and commitment by all the countries of the world. I mean, nobody has actually reneged on them. Nobody is saying that uh, they disagree with them. Um, uh, And that includes the United States at present. Um, But it is a little bit early to to be able to form an overview. Each year, as you know, individual countries come to the UN to give a report on their performance. Ireland's turn came up this year. All those reports suggest that countries are working very actively to implement them. But as I say, it's a little early in terms of getting an overview. I know, uh, I think it's Minister Dennis Nocton launched the Irish kind of strategy for the next couple or few years on the SDGs. Are you happy with what he's launched? Uh, yes, the, the, um, there was a, a voluntary national review done by Ireland of its own performance and that was on the back of a national implementation plan which had been uh, uh, agreed within government a few months earlier. Um, you know, it, it, it's, that was not for me to kind of comment on what's largely a, a, a domestic agenda but I, I think uh, Ireland gave a very good account of itself um, at uh, the UN and uh, what I liked about it, I have to say, was that it was a, a frank and honest uh, review which recognised the strengths of what we're doing, but also acknowledged that there were areas where we need to work harder. And I thought that actually stuck out a bit among the other voluntary national reviews, which tended to be a little bit self-congratulatory. I thought Ireland's one was uh, uh, a more genuine sort of document. And what's left to needed to do to, to, to achieve the SDGs? You understand the plan is to achieve them by 2030. Like, what's, what, what else do we have to do, if you know what I mean? Well, the question of resources is hugely important. Uh, I mean, to give you an idea, it has been estimated that to achieve the SDGs in full for the whole world will require uh, something in the order of five 
trillion dollars a year. Now, that won't be uh, produced just by governments. In fact, uh, they, won't, they won't come anywhere near it. The private sector uh, will be a key partner. By that, I mean the international private sector as well as uh, companies within each country. Um, so uh, they are op- opting into this agenda on the basis of sustainability. I mean, that's, the, if you like, the admission ticket. They have to be willing to uh, follow uh, sustainable business practices. And, but but in fact, so far, they have the, the, the companies in question have all demonstrated great commitment to the agenda. They want to invest in it partly for obvious commercial motives, but partly also uh, for reasons to do with uh, corporate social commitment um, and, and corporate social responsibility. They do see an opportunity to make a, a contribution to to the common good as well as opening up new markets for themselves such as in Africa so it's a kind of win-win situation for the private sector from both points of view and that's why they are so enthusiastic They they are or they aren't? They aren't? They are enthusiastic about uh, becoming involved in the implementation of the SDGs They were part of the so-called stakeholders who accompanied the negotiations along with civil society, academia, the research community, etc. So, you know, the private sector have had a stake in this for the last few years. And as I say, for a mixture of corporate social responsibility and uh, an interest in new markets, they see advantage in being involved. But it's all on the basis of these companies also pledging that they support sustainable business practices. Are you talking about multinationals? It would be all kinds of companies, uh, companies within uh, each country and also multinationals. Are there any in Ireland? Well, I, I, it really is up to each uh, corporate sector to decide what it wants to do um, and I don't have any greater knowledge on the Irish uh, situation than on any other country but overall, I'm speaking sort of globally, overall the business sector is very, very interested. Okay, Dave, it's great to meet you. You've done great work. I hope you're enjoying your retirement day. Thank you, Darren. I am indeed. Thank you. And now I'm talking to Paul Uzel from ATD. Uh, Paul, how's it going? Um, could you tell us what's going on here today, please? Um, today is the, the launch of a, of a project that we we're involved in. Uh, the, your rights are written in stone. And it's a, it was a lot, a, lot, a lot of work put together by uh, the team. And today is like the accumulation of it all. And it's the, your rights are written in stone. And we, the whole idea of the project was, was the toy this project to toy people into the you know, the poverty stone which is by, just located which is only sorry located just across the road next to the famine memorial and it's the kind of people toyed into the idea of their rights their human rights and then how best to employ them how to learn them get an understanding of them and this was like an educational type thing so it could be brought to schools if possible both the communities family resource centres and that was the the idea behind it and then there was a lot of creativity in it the project was your rights are written in stone and there was a creative side to it to get people to put an expression of sentiment of their rights, their love, their desire or whatever, their hopes for the future and to try and tie it to the project which is your rights are written in stone which is to reinforce the, the message which is on the public stone here in Dublin 1 just across the road that like your rights are important and they don't mean that to unless you like, take hold of them you know, yeah. and take hold, sorry And there's a big emphasis today this afternoon on the SDGs isn't there? Yeah, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a it's a big package and it's a mouthful, but it's a it's when you look at it, it it's, it's vital to what needs to be done in, in society because uh, the 17 goals which are in the Sustainable Development Goals, 17, there's number one would be like no poverty, number two is no hunger, uh, access to quality education, uh, clean environment. So it's, it's it's important to society and to the people within it, and like that's why we use the your rights are written in stone to tie to the poverty stone the whole approach is a human rights approach to to like, the care the, the failings in society basically because with homelessness in Dublin but we have homelessness all around the world it's just it's just hopefully that people will take hold of their own their own right their own human rights and try and uh, apply it to their life and put the pressure to their politician probably that like, this needs to happen or you know, especially around the uh, sustainable development goals, it's a, it's a serious thing. You know, it's it, it's it's a global thing. It's not just about oil. It's not just a small little thing. It, it, it's massive, and I think people really need to get an understanding of it, the public, because it's coming online. You know, and there's, there's going to be changes, massive changes around the world. 
because of it. So, like, uh, it's to get an understanding of it, to really de- equip yourself so you know what's coming, where, what's going to be happening within society. Like, to just, just play your part, isn't it? Like, and that's the whole idea of your right to the stone. Hopefully, people will attach something to that project and go look at the poverty stone and see what the sentiment is, the history behind it, what's happening in these communities, this community. And that's, that'd be my. That was my part in, in part of the project. I'm looking forward to now to seeing the launch of it because there's an awful lot of work went into it and it's, uh, it speaks for itself, the project. If, you, if people can have a look right here and maybe go look at the stone and you realise it's next to the famine memorial. And these are all like, these are like memorials to people that suffered poverty, injustice. And that's what your rights are written in stone as well. You know, we want people to look at instead of just injustice in your life, it's a discrimination. Are you being failed with the system? Why? Question it, you know what I mean? And that's what your human rights are. It's the ability to question without being like beaten off the street or you know, it's like it toys them with your right to protest. Not violently, of course, but it's equip yourself because we have a society now where people don't know what's going on. They're just being told by the political masters, this is what's happening or that's what's happening to me, just telling what's happening. And, you know, just for me it's playing your part. Now I'm talking to Gary Broderick from Sale. Gary, how's it going? Will you tell us a bit about your organisation for us, please? Sale is a project for women who are um, caught in the, the poverty and the, and the struggle of addiction. And uh, we work with them to try and help them through um, those issues. But it's specifically for women um, and their children. So we work with the women, um, helping them get stability, move out of poverty through education and uh, opportunity to try other things. And are you, is, is the organisation going along? We've been going since 1995, so we've been around a little while, yeah. And you're yeah. based in Dublin City Centre, are you? We're based in Amien Street. Yeah, we, uh, our website is saleproject.ie if you want to have a look at what we do. Oh, cool, yeah. Uh, and uh, you're involved in today's event, are you? Yes, I've, um, we've, we, we're very interested in making sure that the people understand the link between addiction and poverty. And um, so we were, we've been heavily involved in poverty and linking human rights and poverty and addiction together because when people are experiencing poverty in their life they're much more likely to become addicted they're much more likely to have their human rights violated um, and they're they're going to be the ones who are unhealthy have less opportunities in life so we want to tie all those things together we're too quick to blame people for being addicts or for being poor or for being uh, not responding the way but actually when we set people up right from the get-go in their life it's very hard for them to break out of that and are you much of a supporter of the SDGs as well? Um, we try. Uh, one of the things that we're doing all the time is kind of highlighting the links. We do a lot of work um, going out to universities and meeting with students, um, with our women, um, and really helping people make those links so that we can particularly pay attention to how poverty is impacting the people that they'll be working with in the future. Now I'm talking to Stephen. Did you enjoy the event this afternoon here? Yeah, I thought it was beneficial for many different countries. Ireland, it doesn't really matter um, what country you're from or what nationality you are. Um, it's just nice that people have concerns for us all as people. You know? And, uh, y- y- you know Pierre from ATD. Are you involved with ATD, his organisation? I did do the odd event with him. I did do the singing and the best I can do and I'd be with other organisations and you know I just try and do what I can do for you, you were saying to me before the interview that you're homeless are you? Yeah, I'm a homeless individual and uh, do you st- where do you, s- do you sleep in um, where do you sleep on the street or different places where I can lay in my head that's what you say that's my home <laughs> are you homeless for long? Um, about four and a half months now. Um, they've been trying to help me in um, Pier Street and um, the Lighthouse. Um, I attend the church of, in the Liberties. It's a new Vaughan Christian church. Um, I'm due to go to recovery um, on Friday. So. Recovery from, is it drink or drugs or something there? Um, I was on methadone. Mm. I've reduced myself down to 40 milligrams. Mm. You know, so I'm just hoping this can give someone some hope. Mm. You know, I'm mm. not looking to be 
beneficial in any way. But I know Paul, I've met Paul a few times. He's a very nice guy. The end poverty celebrations, years at the Human Rights and Poverty Stone. That's a very important issue to a lot of different people, especially the homeless people and the working class people. That obviously they pay their taxes. And they're the people we have to congratulate because if it wasn't for them, where would we be? You know? Is there anything else you want to say? Um, my father, he's had a couple of strokes, you know, and he's been very sick of late. It's my eldest brother, he takes care of him. I have a lot to thank my brother for, and Tiglin and different places and organisations, you know. But thanks to Paul Yuzel for introducing me to all this, you know, he does very good work, he does. Uh, I interviewed him earlier today. What? I interviewed him earlier today. Yeah. Uh, ah, he's fabulous, he's a great guy, uh, you know, but hopefully this raises awareness for a lot of different people, uh, you know. Now I'm talking to Pierre Klein from ATD. Pierre, how's it going? Pierre, I was talking to your colleague, um, Paul Yuzan earlier, can you just tell us just a bit about today? Yes, today we are launching two exhibitions, one which is in the building of the Epic Island uh, Museum and which is called the CHQ building and the exhibition in the CHQ is called Your Rights Are Written in Stone and it tells the story of your human rights and poverty stone which is on Custom House Key here in Dublin next to the famine statues and the second exhibition we are launching is called Make Poverty History it's an exhibition of quotes uh, which are printed on banners and all, and we have 40 banners on the railings of Custom House Key next to the famine statues which are inspiring banners, inspiring quotes we give, we pay tribute to many strong uh, social justice leaders from Mandela to Martin Luther King to Joseph Rezinski to James Connolly to Gandhi and Desmond Tutu uh, even Pope Francis I think is a social justice uh, defender so we, 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 we hope all these quotes and the exhibition in CHQ all the banners will invite people to mark next UN Day for the Eradication of Poverty, 17 of October. And it's great that David Donahue is here, isn't it? Yeah, we, we are very happy because the exhibition was, has been opened today by the ambassador, former Irish ambassador to the UN, the man who, with Ambassador Camo from Kenya, managed to convince 193 countries to adopt and sign together the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and also to keep in the agenda what we call the leave no one behind promise. So a promise where we say we want to reach the furthest behind first, we want to make sure that all the 17 goals of the agenda are, will be said they are reached only if they are reached for everybody. And this is a very, very important promise.